Uh, yeah, I'm Ian Schuler, I'm Development Seed. We're a shop that does a lot of work with open data and open source, and I'm here to talk to you. I guess we've, we've heard about water, we've heard about air, and now we're going to talk about land from space. So we'll have basically everything covered by the end of the presentation. Uh, let's see. Uh, imagery data, whether it's from satellites or drones, is some of the most valuable open data that exists. Uh, lo Location-based data in, in itself, GPS data, is estimated, depending on who you talk to, between a, a 40 to $100 billion a year industry. And the data that comes from satellite images is, is just as valuable uh, to, for uses in everything from agriculture to forestry to mining to public safety uh, and, and others. And so there's tremendous uh, economic value and social value to be derived from from imagery, uh, but it's been very difficult to work with. Uh, it's been uh, a set of, of data that has been uh, in the hands of a few, and, and some of the things that we're trying to do is to make it much more widely available. So every day there are 175 Earth observation sat satellites that circle the Earth and take pictures. Take pictures of things like this and like this, uh, all, all throughout the, the, the world, blind to borders, blind to uh, economic ability, constantly collecting information. Some of that data is coming in as raw pictures like these, but also satellites have the ability uh, to see uh, spectrum that the, the human eye can't. So you can look at ultraviolet light, and you can look at infrared light, you can look at soil moisture, you can look at elevation, you can look at other things that tell you really interesting things like the health of vegetation, or uh, where might be areas that are prone to landslides, or, uh, or where are areas that there seem to be economic development. And that data together is, a, is of tremendous value for, uh, for everything, for understanding the Earth and understanding the Earth's populations. Uh, this data is tremendously valuable to people who are understanding, uh, trying to uh, understand the effects of climate change, uh, people who are, are looking at, at conservation of, of forests, of sea, uh, people who are managing wildfires uh, and trying to uh, work uh, through disasters on the ground, whether, again, whether that's wildfires or whether that's uh, uh, understanding the effects of flooding in areas that are most likely to be impacted by upcoming floods. Uh, putting that over imagery gives you an idea of what the likely uh, impact of that is going to be. Or you could look at, use it from an accountability standpoint as well. So this is an example in Mexico where there were two hurricanes in, in a row that hit Mexico in 2013. Uh, this is an example of taking the imagery that was that historic imagery and comparing that to the locations of, uh, of, uh, of projects that, uh, where the government funded rec reconstruction projects. Uh, so to see, was that funding spent in places where that seems to be that was appropriate? And, uh, and to be able, to, for the public, to uh, be able to compare that, uh, that public finance da data with the, the actual storm events to drive additional data or drive additional information. Here's an example of using 20 years of open nighttime imagery uh, to understand the development of India from 1992 to 2012. So there's a, a really great data set, the MSP, of, of nightly satellite imagery for uh, across the world. Uh, it's you know, a data set that's messy in a lot of ways, but it provides a really, really rich uh, set of insights into uh, into uh, development across the globe and, and gives you the ability uh, to look at specifically where is there light at night, uh, light uh, in the, in the uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. time when, when people are turning on the lights. And that allows you to see a lot of different interesting things. One, you can see Diwali from space, which is pretty cool, that the Festival of Lights is actually visible from space. Um, but another thing that's quite interesting is you can look at it to see how re resources are allocated. And so here's an example of uh, in Uttar Pradesh, in northern India, the yellow line is the average, uh, elect uh, the average light output curve over 20 years for the, the area Uttar Pradesh, or a constituency, Hardoi, in, in Uttar Pradesh as a whole. The red line is one constituency within Hardoi. Uh, and so you can see that this period that spans between uh, around 2000 uh, 1998 and, and 2001, uh, it bumps above the average. And so you can start to ask questions about, well, why, why did that area get, have a higher level of light output than others? And it turns out that that area 
the MP from that area was put in as the Minister of Energy for that exactly that period of time where there's a bump in the in the light output from that area of the of the, uh, the country. And as soon as uh, he was no longer the Minister of of Energy for Uttar Pradesh, it goes back to normal levels until it bounces again at the uh, more recently in the last few years. So we're not sure what happened there. Maybe a, a cousin uh, was able to get the the ministry at some point later. So. What to do with all this data? Again, there are 175 satellites circling the Earth every day, tr generating tremendous amounts of data. What does this look like and where is this coming from? And to what degree is that data actually open? Well, the majority of open data still comes from government sources of one sort or another. For imagery data, uh, the, uh, and, and uh, sort of the, the RBG, the, the, the pictures of the Earth, a lot of that comes from the Landsat program, which has been in in place since 1972, collecting more than 40 years of imagery that's been run by the U.S. government. Uh, exciting, uh, there are, one of the exciting things that's, that's coming, that's happening in the space is that the Sentinel program, the European Space Agency, is an ambitious program to launch seven different satellite missions before 2021, which will collect even better Im imagery, higher quality, higher resolution imagery. The Sentinel-2, uh, which was launched last year, uh, which is their real, uh, one of their, their main imagery gathering satellites, is already producing data, uh, and that data should come online uh, in a more programmatic way within the next few weeks. Um, other satellites that both uh, the European Space Agency and, and NASA put, are putting out are looking at soil moisture, are looking at uh, atmospheric conditions, uh, uh, are, uh, are gathering information uh, about more uh, climate and weather effects. And so that will also be incredibly valuable data uh, for, for uh, researchers, but also for the public at large. Commercial. There's a, been a growing commercial industry around satellite data. Uh, there's been a bit of a revolution in how satellites are built and launched. You've seen the rise of small satellites, uh, which are cheaper, they're easier to build, uh, and you uh, can deploy them in droves or in fleets rather than having one big satellite that's collecting once a day, you can have essentially continuous coverage or daily coverage of the entire planet. Uh, you also, the, uh, red, the greater availability of launch vehicles has made it possible to do this. So with entry of companies like SpaceX, it's easier to get things into space and that's creating a lot of data. The, to date, there aren't many companies that are providing open data in, uh, in the satellite space. Um, there are a few uh, examples of this uh, being the case, primarily around natural disasters. And so uh, around Nepal, for instance, a number of satellite companies, Skybox, Planet Labs, and Digital Globe, each release publicly available imagery over Nepal to anybody who, for whom it could be of use. And so around disasters in particular, you do have a bit of a, a, an example or a bit of a history of, of providing open data. It, it seems that there's an interest in expanding that further and it's likely to expand over the next few years. Uh, the, a number of companies have made commitments about data that they would release in the public. Skybox has a Skybox for Good program and they are already producing, releasing imagery uh, of developmental value or um, uh, of emergency response value. Planet Labs recently uh, at the United Nations Global Goals Summit uh, made a commitment to release $60 million worth of imagery. Uh, uh, Aquila Space is a company that's not only interested in releasing imagery, but actually the hardware designs to produce satellites, although that's being held up by regulatory issues. So you have people on all sides who are seeing the benefit of open in aerospace and, and the, the benefit of this open data, and, are, uh, are, and I think that increasingly we'll see commercial providers also involved in the open imagery game. And interestingly, hobbyists, and this is a bit where drones come in, uh, the, uh, in this, the, there's a, it is easier for people who are interested in providing imagery of, of their, or, or wherever the world that they're interested in collecting it, to, to gather that information and to provide it uh, openly. And the drone, uh, drones have become extremely popular as a hobbyist uh, activity as well. Uh, I think we're hopeful that in the same way that individual mappers and geographers and, and individual community organizers help to create an asset as rich as OpenStreetMap of uh, map of, of 
address and map uh, data from around the world, that we, we're on the precipice of being able to do something similar where we can actually have an evolving picture of the entire Earth that's being maintained by people who have a commitment to open data in, in public domain. And so what, the, the, the hobbyist side, I think, is extremely exciting. The trouble is, is that imagery data is still really hard to work with. There aren't a lot of very good tools. Uh, it is very heavy. It's, it is expensive to, to maintain. It's expensive to move. Uh, and so part of what we need to do if we really want to power an open data revolution around imagery is to make it easier for more people to be engaged in the process. Uh, some of that starts with government and making that those rich stores of government data, Sentinel data, Landsat, and other data sets more accessible. Uh, one great example of this was uh, uh, earlier this year, AWS committed to taking the last two years of Landsat imagery, Landsat 8 imagery, and putting it on uh, AWS in S3 bucket, putting it on AWS in a way that it can be very easily programmatically accessed. Uh, and that makes it, takes it from being, you know, where it was technically available if you were willing to navigate the uh, USGS's system and to learn how that worked and to, uh, and to go in and, and download that data uh, yourself, it made it more programmatically available and easier to navigate and easier to work with. And that allowed us to build other tools on top of it uh, that would make it wi more widely available to other audiences. Sentinel data is not quite at that point yet. I think Sentinel data, while it is tech, the license is right, they have the license right for public use, for commercial, all the things you would want it to have. The actual technical infrastructure to make it readily available is, isn't there. And so this is, would be a great thing for Europe to take on, is to take that fantastic data that's coming in through the Sentinel program and use that as an engine for geo uh, growth in the, in the open geo industry across the, across the continent and, and globally uh, by making that data more accessible. Currently, the situation with Sentinel data is with still a lot of, of NASA and U USGS data is that if you are a researcher, you're a scientist, and you have the time to learn uh, how to use some very specific tools, uh, and if you have the you know, the patients for dealing with the registering and, and getting approved and getting and dealing with the system, then you have the ability to do some very, very powerful things with that data, but it's not accessible to every, everybody. And so some of the things that we were able to do, again, off AWS, is to make it available to two very key markets, or two very key sets of people. One is individuals who aren't experts, who aren't GIS experts or remote sensing experts, but who want to be able to access this information, a journalist or uh, a community organization or a company. And so uh, building very friendly, uh, user-friendly interfaces, this is an example of Libra, which is an entirely open source tool for accessing Landsat imagery. Uh, this makes it much more easy for people to, to find and, and begin to use that, that data or make the data programmatically accessible, so it doesn't actually require a human at all. Uh, another set of tools we built called, uh, called Landsat Util allows you to script out the use of uh, the, the collection, the processing, uh, and the publishing of, of satellite imagery to make that, build, give those building blocks that allow it to be more easily plugged into other things. And so with those together, we were able to build a two, two very specific tools uh, that, um, that we think are, are, are useful to this audience. One is Open Aerial Map, which is a, uh, a place, uh, uh, it is an index of openly licensed satellite and drone imagery from around the world. And so here's an example in the Philippines of drone imagery that was collected after, her, after Haiyan. Uh, it could be put online to allow other people to use that as a tracing layer for OSM or allow researchers to be able to look at past data and, and projecting uh, future information, and you have all of that archive of data through time, so you can see how uh, you can see data from different different points, pre-disaster, post-disaster, just the evolution of, of a, an area over time. That that tr is a, uh, again is a, is a place where you can collect uh, available open imagery. This is particularly useful for drone operators who are gathering a lot of imagery but don't have an easy way to make it available and make it discoverable to a wider audience. And so uh, Open Aerial Map is, is an attempt to have a, a, a home for all of the openly licensed uh, uh, imagery. And this is something that you know, we've, we are a technical partner in, but it's being done in partnership with a number of other organizations, the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, uh, Planet Labs, and a number of other, of other groups. Another example is a commercial example of 
uh, organization, Astro Digital, a company that took the tools that, uh, that, that we developed in order to make monitoring possible. And so this is an example of setting up a way to monitor a shale field to, for any new imagery uh, and do automatic processing of that imagery so that decision makers in the field can have access to imagery and data derived from that imagery immediately. And so that, again, gets to the, the, the question that Hatem had posed earlier today of how do we take out open data and actually make it actionable, and actually make it answer questions for people. Uh, so that's where we, I think we see the field uh, right now. Uh, we think it's a really exciting time. If you're interested in joining, there's an event next week in Washington, D.C. for anybody who happens to be there called SAT Summit. We'll be discussing some of those things, and anybody here who's interested in going can get a free ticket using that coupon code. Thanks very much. Fantastic.